my name is Pallav Nadhani, and I have come from Calcutta. I know, please do not give me a laugh on that. I've received a lot of satiric laughs uh, whenever I say I've come from Calcutta. And uh, today, I'm going to be sharing about uh, my journey of how I started Fusion Charts. So no gyan. I do not have any gyan. I'm just going to tell you what I did, very raw and very open. Um, I'll try to keep it within, say, around 30, 35 minutes so that thereafter you can pose me any questions, uh, whatsoever it is. So, uh, as I mentioned, I run a product company from Calcutta. It's a small city in East India, if you do not know. Uh, it was started by me when I was 17, uh, fresh out of school. Uh, and as uh, Ashish mentioned, uh, we have not raised any funding till now. It's a totally bootstrapped company. And as of today, we have over uh, 17,000 customer organizations and 3.3 lakh users in 110 countries. And 80% of the Fortune 500 companies are already our clients. Now, here comes the shocker part. Fusion Charts wasn't actually meant to be a product. Uh, it wasn't meant to be a business. It was actually meant to be a way for me to earn my pocket money. So this was when I was 16 and 17, and I used to hate to go to my dad and ask him to fund my uh, every single bill. And I thought, hey, this is, uh, this is the IT generation, and I'm a nerd. Sitting behind a computer, I could possibly get some money. So why not do that? And that is how the whole uh, concept and this journey started. So I was 16, and your regular kid, this is pretty much what I looked like when I was 16. Uh, entirely messed up room, no timelines, do whatever you want to do. And at 16, you have aspirations. Aspirations even in terms of your email address. Your email address wants to speak whatever you think your personality is like. So hot, dude, cool, hot male, a bunch of all this. And what I ended up was something like this. This was my first email address. Hot underscore cool underscore do 1984 at hotmail.com. Yeah, embarrassing now, but true, fa true story. And like any teenager, I used to love to go to uh, Cafe Coffee Day. That was the rage back then. Go out, hang at bowling alleys, uh, go out, get drunk, hang around with chicks, party all night. But there was one small problem. All of it needed a lot of money. And I really made a lot of money when you were 16. Even a 500 rupee note is a lot of money then because you cannot go every single day and ask your dad. And that is when I thought, if I need all this money and I don't want to go to my dad, what is my only option? And as luck would have it, I was a nerd. So I sat on my computer and I thought, what can I do? What can make me money without the world knowing that I'm a 16-year guy? So there was this website called asptoday.com. Uh, by Rocks Publications. And they used to pay like really good money for writing innovative articles. So good money to the tune of $1,500 per article, which is uh, for a 60,000 word article, you used to get almost 60,000 rupees. So the back of my, in the back of my mind, my calculation was, boy, that's like one rupee a word. What better could it get? And no one comes to know what is going on. So I sat down on my computer and started hacking. And back in those days, Adobe Flash, or Macromedia Flash, as it was then called, was a tool which was primarily used for uh, banner, banner animations and website intros. Um, it was not very much used for business applications. So I thought, can I do something with this? Maybe combine it with a business technology and put up something for which people would either pay or they like it. And back in those days, I was using a lot of Microsoft Excel uh, for my school projects. And I absolutely hated the look and feel of all the charts there. I mean, it was the most ugly thing I've ever seen in my life. If I see that again, I'll still throw up on that. It was that ugly. So the whole idea was, uh, can I mix Macromedia Flash and let's say Microsoft ASP to build something which would be of use to business? And I recognize that every business has its data, whatsoever business it is and they need to visualize it better. If I don't like Excel, there are going to be a good section of, pe a section of people who do not like Excel charts as well. And that is where the first idea was born, and I wrote an article on it. 
and I got paid $1,500 as well. So that entire money lasted for like full five months on a lot of things. And this resulted in the creation of the first product, uh, Fusion Chart. So what happened was, after writing the article and posting it, a lot of developers who read that article, uh, they actually gave a lot of feedback. Uh, they said, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Uh, some even went to the extent of saying, I would pay you to do this. And then the Marwari blood in my veins started hearing money, 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 more money, more money than $1,500. And I thought, OK, there it is. I've got $1,500. People are saying they're going to pay me more. Why not do that? Why not productize it? Why not offer it to someone who is willing to pay? And that resulted uh, in the creation of the first product called Fusion Charts. So sitting in this uh, auditorium today, most of you might have used Fusion Charts in one way or the other without even knowing about it. So I'm going to quickly show you how you might have used it. So this is weather.com. So if you, have, if you ever wanted to travel outside and you were wondering whether your shorts would be good for the weather there, and you looked at the weather prediction charts, all these charts are powered by Fusion Charts. LinkedIn polls, if you're collecting feedback and you're seeing all the data visualization, all the polls there are powered by Fusion Charts. Same with Facebook polls. Uh, Google Docs, if you add those interactive, animated, and uh, good-looking charts, like the animated ones, all of those are powered by our product again. Uh, Rediff.com stock charts um, on the home page and some of the Rediff money section, that's ours. Same with money control home page, uh, where if you're dealing in stocks, these charts are powered by our product, uh, borrowing one of them. Uh, this is the federal ID dashboard. Uh, this was introduced in United States of America a uh, couple, I would say, a year back. And this helps Americans track where the government is spending money on IT projects. And all the charts, all the data visualization, which you see on most of these US government websites, that is actually powered by our product as well. And who's this? Obama, that's right. Uh, this is Mr. Barack Obama, the President of the United States of America, having his sweet time with Fusion Charts as a part of the United States uh, Federal IT dashboard. And trust me, none of us are good in Photoshop. Uh, this is a real photo from the uh, government website of US, uh, United States of America. And we picked it up from there. And since then, it has been our biggest marketing tool. And if you ever see me doing any presentation, you'll always find this photograph, even if you're bored of it. So why am I here? Uh, I said to share my journey. Throughout this journey, I've uh, done a lot of mistakes. I mean, for every one thing that I did right, I probably did 100 things wrong. And today, I'm just going to pick up some random aspects from some of the things we think we did right and just present it to you in a very story-oriented format, and I'll leave the takeaway to you, whatever you can take out of it. So right from day one, we understood that Excel sucks, in short. And we were really passionate about making charts look much good, much better, more interactive, more spicy, uh, with the animation, with the interactivity. And it's been eight years. All we've been doing is still working on charts. Charts, 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 and charts. And we have not got bored of it yet. And that is something which we are very passionate about. And when we started, we never had a focus group. It was an experimental article to earn pocket money. So the point which I'm trying to make here is if you're starting a product and you're expecting a focus group to come and tell you what your product should be, more often than not, you'll eventually fail. Because focus groups can help you identify flaws, or it can help you identify what's not working well or what's working well, rather than come up with an innovation. Uh, if you're a product startup or if you're a startup, you are the only guy who's the focus group, which you have to understand. And right from day one, our product was guided by customers. Customers said, we'll pay you money if you do this. We'll pay you money if you do that. And that is how it has been. But one of the takeaways which we have uh, from our journey is do not blindly follow the customers. So there's a very good saying by Henry Ford. 
So Henry Ford is a guy behind Ford Motors. He said, if I were to listen to customers, I would have to devise faster horses. And he was the guy who devised cars, because people did not know about cars. They would have said, I need faster horses. Take another example, an iPhone. Before Apple introduced iPhone, people might have wanted smaller iPods. They never thought of a combination of a phone and an iPod. So customers will tell you a lot of things. I want this, I want that. It has to run through your filter system, because you are the thought leader. Uh, you are the person with the expertise, uh, with the experience of what you're building. And the way we do it is for everything which the customer says, we put three parameters to it. Value, what is the value which other customers would derive and this customer would derive on a generic scale? Usability, if we do this, can everybody use it? And feasibility, can our team pull it off? We are no Google, we do not have rocket scientists. So anything which is too complex, probably we might have to drop it because we do not have the bandwidth to do it. So based on customer uh, discovery, like as I said, we started with one product, Fusion Charts. And our customers kept on saying, we need this, we need this. And each of our products thereafter actually has been driven by customers, filtered by us. So we started with one product. Uh, today we sell uh, 16 products. So these are our four core products and a bunch of vertical products. And all centered around one single thing. Charts, charts, charts. Moved into maps and gauges, which is all a bigger part of the data visualization. And that, that is something which we have uh, absolutely focused on and never changed our stream. Now you might be wondering, why is this guy here? All he is doing is selling a charting component, which has been there, done that to death. I mean, how hard it is to build a charting component. Put four good engineers in a room, give them six to 12 months of time, and they'll probably come up with a charting component. There are at least 50 open source charting components out there, which do not even uh, charge you a dime. So why is it that we are getting paid? Why is it that people like us? Why is it that customers are coming back to us and saying we need this and that. So I believe it's for one very simple reason. Uh, because we never focused on the what and the how of the product. So the what is the features, and the how is the implementation. Uh, right from day one, we featured on the why of the product. Why are we doing these charts? And those are very simple principles we followed. We are doing these charts so that they look good, so that people like me do not have to throw up when Microsoft Excel charts come on the screen so that people really look at charts, and when they look at charts, they probably look at the underlying data. And that has been the single USP which we pitch to all our clients, stunning charts. Anything which is good looking, we deliver for your application. And what, ha what this has done for us is it has helped us from not getting into the commodized uh, warfare. When you're focusing on what, when you're focusing on how, you're getting into a, you're commoditizing your product, and eventually, you're just one of the players. But if you're focusing on why, you are putting your soul into it. If somebody copies it, he can copy the features, he cannot copy the soul of the product. He cannot copy your principles. So your principles, the why factor, has to be behind your product. And that is what is going to help you differentiate your product. So another way, benefits versus features, like you have to tell the customer what is the benefit vis-a-vis, -vis, what is the feature? So if I were to put my product in feature ways, we have a homegrown true 3D engine, we have a whole bunch of comprehensive options, XML, JSON, API, and a bunch of these technical stuff. Does it all matter for a customer? Probably at a later stage, yes. But the first selling point we do is charts that look the best, and that is what our customers pay us for. So a funny anecdote here. So when we started our product, uh, our first product slogan, in my, all my naiveness, was the extensive, real-time, animated, graphing solution. Yes, you're right. This, is our, this was our product slogan. The extensive, real-time, animated, graphing solution. Why extensive? Because it had all of six chart types. When I was 17, all I knew that there was six chart types. There was a line chart, there was a pie chart, there was a bar chart, there was an area chart, there was a column chart, and there was a donut chart. And I thought that's the end of charting world. Nothing more, nothing less. And after doing that six chart, so I thought, boy, this is extensive. This is the most extensive. So extensive. Real time, because it could connect to your databases, do live plotting, so real time. Animated, because the charts were, all the charts were animated, and graphing solution for the obvious reasons. 
Now, what happened was, when we are doing marketing, when we are listing our product in categories, in different directories, a couple of directories, when I went to enter our product tagline, so when you go to enter into directories, they have product names, product tagline, and a short description about the product. So they restricted the product tagline to 35 characters, a text field which is 35 characters. Here my tagline is 51 characters. I'm like, what a bunch of buggers. They cannot even write code properly. How can you fit the entire product tagline, which is so extensive, in 35 characters? And I was pissed off at them. And that was long back. And then I thought, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Let's look around. So I saw Nike. Nike says, just do it. Just do it? Do what? Then do it. That means they are selling every single thing, right, from shoes to apparels to uh, your tennis rackets. And Nike is saying, take our stuff, just do whatever you want. And then we look at, looked at McDonald's. I'm loving it. From burgers to sodas to ice creams, you love McDonald's. We all love McDonald's. And I thought, hey, this is cool. If these guys can do something like that, why don't I try something like this? And what I found was, just love doing it. <laughs> Nike's just do it. McDonald's says, I'm loving it. Just love doing it. But I mean, as you can see, for obvious reasons, I couldn't use this as the product tagline. And that is when some angels showered her blessings, and we realized, hey, we are good at only one thing. We make your charts look good, so why not stunning charts? And we work across your web applications and enterprise applications. Simple as that. And this became our elevator pitch. This became our USP. This became our tagline. This became the whole soul of our product. What we do is we do stunning charts, where we work in your web and enterprise. No more, no less. So one of the reasons, or one of the good points of when I started was I was alone. So I never had to write documentation. And apparently, that culture has followed for us right since then. So even today, when we design a product or we think of a new product, we do not write documentation for the sole reason that if we write, even the guy who wrote it is not going to read it next time. And we are absolutely sure about that. So rather what we do is we get to the prototyping. Not coding, mind you. It's prototyping. And we build a very simple prototype, put it out to users, take their opinion, say what they have to, hear what they have to say about it, come back. If they say, this is not good, put another prototype. Again, send it out. What this does is, help us identify the most basic set of features, which is the minimum viable product that we have to set out. This is the most essential set of features for which customers would have to pay. And this is, the, this is what is going to take you a very short time to deliver. And because of your prototyping, you have already validated your idea with the customers. And be ready to pivot here. A lot of times you may think uh, idea A is good, whereas people might not say, people might not like idea A. For example, Nokia was never supposed to be a phone company. Apple was never supposed to be a consumer idea. All they did was prototype, put it out, listen to customers, came back, and devised something which customers wanted. And minimum viable product has been one of our mantras uh, right since then. So there's a very famous saying by Guy Kawasaki here, uh, don't worry, be crappy. So what he means by this is, when you're prototyping or when you're doing that minimum viable product, most of us sitting in this room will think, hey, if I put this out, customers would not use it. This is like embarrassing. It's so shameful. I don't have this, I don't have that, whereas every other feature, every other company whom I'm competing with has this feature. So Guy Kawasaki says, don't worry about it. Set the first, set the first feature out, the most important part of the product. You might absolutely be crappy. Uh, you might absolutely suck. But you know what? It's OK to suck initially. Each one of us, we're sucking initially. And with this, what you do is you actually validate. And even if you fail, you fail very cheap without having to spend a lot of months doing something which nobody wanted in the first place. And I talked about pivoting. So when you start with an idea, or when we started with an idea for a couple of our products, it was vastly different from what we actually delivered. There was a huge gap between the initial idea and the final product.
the final product was but but the final product was driven by customers it was driven by customer validation it was driven by prototyping and the final product actually earned us money the initial idea would have bombarded we talked about stunning charts so when it comes to our product design is one of the most important things and by design i do not mean just how it looks design is the way you interact with it design is the way you feel about the product design is the way your entire product is uh, engineered as well so we all love apple products here i mean i know most people love apple products here and most of us have started to hate microsoft or dell there's a very simple difference in their whole culture yeah there are microsoft guys here i can talk to you later on <laughs> so there's a very simple uh, difference in approach here when apple starts with something they start reverse they start with the user experience they say this is what i want the end product to be this is how it should, it should look feel interact and then they take a step back they build the software then they go to the hardware guys and say hey build me a hardware to run this software then some of these other companies do they start with the hardware first and then they go to the software so it's a reverse uh, philosophy where you might actually be constricted by a hardware whereas if you start by user design you are not constricted by anything your so as a ceo as a product startup or as a product manager the functional user experience is absolutely your responsibility a lot of products have failed not because they had less features but because they had so many more features which customers could not use they could not understand how to use it and some of the most uh, simpler products have succeeded look at twitter how simple can it be look at some of the other software applications you're using look at apple so you have to start with the whole design approach to things so i'll show you a couple of examples that we have done in our um, life cycle so this is uh, so fusion charts runs on xml and json data uh, this is for the technical people out there what i've done is i've taken a simple xml screenshot of data from one of our competitors supposedly a successful one and here they have extensive api they have a lot of customization options but it's so complicated that a person who's starting to use charting might first need to go through the entire history of charting what are the each what are the elements of a chart what does it look like how can i configure them and a whole bunch of information we thought a person who's coming to us doesn't necessarily know about a chart all he needs is a simple chart which looks good why make him run through all of it why make him learn all of it and we said hey there's this data which we could just convert into a very simple example a simple xml and start using it let all the complications be in our code let all the engineering be in our code and this is something which had uh, given us a lot of uh, traction because we are very easy to use so in effect what happened was our first usp became stunning charts and our second usp became get started in 15 minutes or we refund your money and that is something which we absolutely guarantee to all our customers because it was design oriented if your developers do not get started in 15 minutes he cannot build the first chart in 15 minutes your product is free and had we been the had we gone the engineering approach uh, we would have gone for a much better api more extensive api for getting the user layer so again reiterating the point make it easy for your customers so some of the other things that we do is if you have to use fusion charts you get started in 15 minutes we do not have installations we do not have any complicated setup it's simple copy paste and you're done if you're upgrading from one version to another version it's 30 seconds absolutely 30 seconds you do not have to change code you do not have to uh, redo any configuration and that's all of that is taken care by us and people love us for that so personally our team or even us we are very inspired by apple here how many of you have faced issues when you had to upgrade your microsoft windows laptop from windows 2000 or from say one windows xp machine and you had to buy another windows xp machine and you had to manually transfer your data and spent more than 2 hours on it raise your hands good chunk of you and how many of you have used apple and used the migration assistant how much time did it take 10 minutes and how many clicks one click that's how apple does it for you so if you have one apple laptop you buy another apple laptop there's a utility which helps you do a one click transfer of your data from this laptop to that laptop how simple can it get and it's called my apple migration kit migration utility 
Same in terms of backup. So Windows 7 has good backup, but previous versions you had to do a lot of complicated things. Apple Time Machine is an absolute gem of a software. So um, you just plug your USB, everything is done. Everything is backed up and with differential, so using the journal system with differential dates. So you can get a file three versions previously without having to do anything. And that's how simple you should, or all of us should make our products for all the customers. So one of the lessons which I learned or which I still propose is bootstrap or raise the least amount of money when you start. If you have a lot of money, you always have this whole uh, uh, intention to do this and that and that because you have money lying and you have time. If you do not have money, the moment you know that I'm going to run out of money tomorrow, you'll ship it today. And shipping is the most important thing. It's the most important feature of a software product. If you do not ship it, any other feature does not exist. And when you're starting, know what kind of company you're building. There's only one Google, there's only one Facebook, there's only one Twitter. So if you're building a billion dollar company, have an absolute solid model. But not all companies are made to be a billion dollar companies. Fusion charts is not. You know why? Because even if you combine all the competitors, the total available market is less than a billion dollars. So how can we be a billion dollar company? And we're talking about 100 competitors here. So from day one, we were very clear, it's not going to be a billion dollar company. And as a result, we never aspired or we never placed our strategies to be a billion dollar company. And owning 20% of $20 million company, which you could turn around in three years, is way better than owning, say, 3% of a $100 million company, which has raised multiple rounds of funding over five to seven years. And your probability of success in the $20 million company is much higher. So. I say raise less money, possibly bootstrap, get the, uh, get the customers out, get the product out, get customers. And on the internet, it's not the big that eat the small. It's always the fast that eat the slow. They absolutely beat the slow. We have had so many examples where big companies have failed on internet because somebody smaller, somebody more agile came into existence and they absolutely beat the crap out of these big guys. So case and example, our own product. So I'm a huge fan of Apple, and I always was a huge fan of Apple. Till one day, Apple announced iPad. And they said, iPad is not going to support Flash. That was like a kick on our entire business model. Our entire product is in Flash. And if iPad does not support Flash, we run out of business in probably a month, probably lesser. And we had to do something. So for the first week, we ignored it. We said, okay, fine, let's see what happens. So the first customer said, hey, I think my, a few thousand of my users would have iPad and I'll have to drop your product. I said, valid proposition, let's see if we can do something. And we said, okay, fine, you can do this and that, but none of this, which was very scalable and which was very uh, effective. Next day, a customer came, he said, I have a few hundred customers who might be using iPad and your product would not work. Same issue again. And I said, fair enough. Third day, a customer came and he said, hey, I have this one customer who uses iPad and I cannot use your product. And that was the point. I said, if people are going to drop fusion charts because of one customer, we have to take serious action. And putting a fusion charts in iPad in Flash was absolutely technically impossible because iPad did not support it. So we had to go with a HTML and JavaScript 5, HTML5 and JavaScript solution. And building a solution like fusion charts in a month, acquiring all the resources, most to remember in Calcutta, was almost an impossible feat. So what we rather did was we went on, we acquired one of our, we didn't acquire, we acquired an exclusive license of one of our competitor HTML5 products, and we integrated them in Fusion Charts, did a lot of coding and uh, bridge work over that, and we made our product iPad enabled. If you would have thought the bigger way, go ahead, acquire the teams, build the product in-house, we probably might have failed before uh, of certain um, amount of iterations and it would have taken us a lot of time. All we did was license this product and put it into Fusion Charts and make it work like Fusion Charts. And after that, we actually quadrupled our prices. So a situation which was going to put us out of our business actually is now poised to give us 4x more revenues just because we acted fast uh, in that uh, specific scenario. So. 
coming from the product to uh, getting your product out. The hardest part of a product is not building the product. It's actually getting traction for your product. It's very hard to find your first customer, equally hard to find your 10th, 100th, or exp put that to the power of 10. And for this, you have to be very marketing oriented. And you have to build that traction using marketing. A lot of startups that I see or I talk to, they think marketing is something which starts after the product. The product is built, then they'll get the marketing team, they'll hire outsource SEOs or whatsoever, and uh, they'll pu pull the entire marketing strategy. At Fusion Charts, we do not think so. We think the marketing starts before the product has actually even start, before the first line of code has actually been started. The reason being, marketing also drives the design of the product. Let me show you. Uh, so our value proposition is stunning charts, good looking charts. So wherever you go on our website, you always find on the top right, stunning charts. If you download our product, it always says, add water to your applications, the first line. You go to our installation page, it says, you're about to get started in 15 minutes. You go to our gallery, you see a beautiful chart, again saying the same statement. So it's a very consistent message that we are always trying to put. And had this been done after the product had started, going back and changing all of these things, might have been mighty impossible. But since marketing started before the product, every aspect of the product was designed to be marketable. Every aspect was built in a way which the marketing team could pick up and build strategies around it. Uh, another case and example. So when we were building Fusion Charts for Web and Enterprise, a lot of PowerPoint users came to us and said, hey, we want to use it in PowerPoint. And we thought, OK, let's give them something. And we built this product called Oomfo. Oomfo is like the oom factor in PowerPoint. And before Oomfo started, so we had this whole marketing uh, discussion, and we said, PowerPoint already has charts. What better can we do? And we know Fusion Charts had better looking charts. So our marketing tagline, even before the product, was add awesome to your presentation. And since the marketing tagline was this, we had to really put this in the essence of whole product. And when we said awesome to your presentation, we also had to make sure that the UI, the usability of this product, has to be in sync with the tagline. So we opted for a non-standard interface, which PowerPoint users absolutely loved. And the whole product was built with this message in mind. And we even put in viral strategies in the product. So within the product, we have something called tweet about the product to, build, uh, to let other users know. And this has been intensively been picked up. If you just search for this on Twitter, people are like building a chart and they're tweeting about it. Because our marketing started before the product. Now, this is a very, I love this saying by Mark Twain. Many a small thing has been made large by the right kind of advertising. Replace advertising with the context of marketing here. And what I'm not going to do is speak about marketing or how you can market your products. Everybody knows, there is, everybody knows hundreds of different ways to market your products. There's SEO, PPC, PPM, a whole bunch of online, offline, organic, inorganic, inbound, outbound, and you'll find all of it. But what is relevant in India, or if you're building for the domestic market, is SMEs get ignored by the media. You do not have a lot of coverage of small software companies or small service companies by media. All they're interested is in big stories. And this is something which we had to work on and become peer friendly. So rather than talking about the general marketing, I'm going to talk how we got our peer. One simple rule about peer that we learned, if you have to get a good peer, target the average common six pack Joe and build a story that either inspires, motivates, shocks, or absolutely pisses off the common people. That is the only way you can get PR. So I'll give you an example. So this is uh, the federal ID dashboard, which I had showed you, which the US government uses to track uh, $600 billion of investments by the government in IT projects. And if we had to pitch it to the media, like, the federal IT dashboard tracking $600 billion of federal IT investment uses fusion charts intensively. Nobody would read it. The average six-pack common joke will have no motivation to read it. Will he be inspired? Possibly no. Will he be shocked? Yes, probably knowing that America spends almost half of GDP of India just on its IT project. But that's neither his agenda nor my agenda. So we thought how we could revise this uh, PR into something better. 
And we said, let's put it in common man lingo. Barack Obama and his team used fusion charts for data visualization in the federal IT dashboard. Now, people like to read about Barack Obama. They like to read what is going on. But again, we realized there's a lot of jargon here. And a common man could not relate to it. So we disorganized it. Barack Obama and his team used fusion charts in the federal IT dashboard. A lot better, but still, something was missing. Too big. And we said, let's make it short. Let's make it sexy. Barack Obama and his boys use fusion charts. That was it. And then we said, OK, now this is there, but the PR needs a local and a seasonal flavor. Barack Obama is coming to India. Hey, let's use that. So, and Barack Obama is anti-outsourcing. So these are two seasonal flavors. Let's build a story like this. Barack Obama and his boys rely on Made in India software fusion charts in spite of his anti-outsourcing policies. And this became our PR. Uh, so, this became our PR pitch. And we got covered. This was Times of India. We got covered. This was Economic Times. We got covered. Simple Google search. Obama and boys rely on Made in India software. 109,000 results. Time span? 12 days. All of this happened 12 days ago. If you have just gone with a regular PR strategy, time span, 12 months, 12 years. Results, zero. And I'll, I'll actually prove that to you uh, of how it happened to us. So we learned that like, it's very hard to get your PR, post PR right. If you have done it a million times, probably you'll get it right. But if you have uh, not done it, it's going to take time. So um, last year, we actually got an award by Deloitte fast 50 growing companies of India, being a successful product company, and the cleavage was from Kolkata. People did not believe that Kolkata could produce a semi-successful or successful product company. And this actually got us PR. Going to 10,000 customers without a salesperson. They thought we were bullshitting. And we actually showed them stats. They couldn't understand how this whole model works. And we got PR. In the first seven years of the company, never having to hire an MBA. Again, they didn't believe us. But we got PR. And the whole Barack Obama story. So all we had to do was just take things which were already in our company, repackage in a stuff which was romantic, which was sensational, controversial, and we kept on getting PR. And I would advise all of you startups here is to effectively use PR. PR not only gets you customers, it gets you employees, it gets you investors, it gets you into the eye of the common people. So next time when somebody is joining your company, his mom and dad, or even his laundry wallet will not ask you, sir, where do you work? Because they have at least heard about your company. So funny thing happened after you got the Barack Obama PR. Uh, below our office, there were a few guys who were asking, where is this company in this building located who makes software for Barack Obama? And that was uh, uh, like the peak point where we realized this is how effective it is. In a startup, so moving off to another track, I'll very briefly cover the sales part of it. Everyone is into sales. So when I started off, there's a funny anecdote. So I was, pro I was doing all the coding. I was doing all the uh, marketing, all the sales, all the customer support, all the customer coding myself for the first three years. So and often I used to get calls. So in one specific call, a guy, so I was answering his support queries, technical support queries. And then the guy says, hey, I would like to speak to your sales people. Can you transfer the call to the sales guys? And I'm like, uh-uh, I do not have a sales guy. I cannot tell him he's not going to buy me software. So all I do is I say, hey, hold on for a second. And I change my accent. Hi, this is the sales department. How can I help you? And I went on. And just the change of accent convinced him. So anyways, those guys are not very, they cannot recognize Indian accent if you differ too much, or even if you differ a lot. So just the change of an accent helped me make, uh, make, me, uh, helped me make a sale and never having to tell him that this was the same guy and you would not have otherwise bought from him. So one more point with sales is uh, it's also slightly falls into your marketing uh, category is when you're building a product or when you're pitching it to the customers, see if you can build an engagement model around it. See if you can have the customers invest some time into it, invest some emotions into it. How many times has it happened that you've walked into a store and you liked a shirt, but you probably didn't get the right size? And still you bought that, because you tried that and it looks good. Any one of you here? OK. So what had happened was you had put emotions into the shirt. You had put time into the shirt. 
and you wanted returns for that. And if you can build this in your product in terms of free download, in, like the freemium model in terms of free download, in terms of um, getting the customer's data, in terms of even making him excited once he has started using your product, for him to dump your product is going to be very tough unless you're charging a bomb for it. So the whole emotional factor comes into your sales model and then, uh, then your chances of conversions are very high. And uh, till now, we do not have a VP sales. Uh, it's not only the gray hairs that work for sales, you can have a young and a very hungry workforce in your sales, which works very well. Startup hiring. So I'm not going to talk a lot about it. I'm still struggling at it. But a uh, couple of things which has worked for me is when you're hiring for your startup, you actually do not have anything else to sell apart from vision. You have to sell the company's vision. You have to sell them visions like, hey, I'm the CEO, you're going to be directly reporting to me. There are no additional layers. You're not going to be a speck of dust in an organization with hundreds of thousands of people. You're going to be building something which is instrumental. You're going to change the world. A whole lot of vision. And that is what is required when you're hiring your first good guy. And packages and all depends on whether you're funded, you're not funded, but eventually, Whatever you're offering, there are at least 10 more people who will offer better than that. So be prepared for that. And I'm talking about very, um, very simple numbers here. 10 is the minimum. And during hiring, do not take things personally. So if anything happened, when I, so for the first three years, as I said, I was working alone, uh, trying to get the cash flow, trying to build the product. And then I thought, okay, it's time now. I have to grow. I have to build a team. So I first got my office. And I scheduled the first interview. And I was sitting in my office, it was a Saturday morning around 11.30, and this guy rings the door. So I go and I open the door. So I ask the guy, sit. And the guy looked around, and probably in his mind it was working. How many people are here? So I said, it's a Saturday, don't worry. And then he comes in, and, he, so, and then I go to my cabin and I call him, hey, come on. So he's like, uh, okay. And he sits. And I start taking the interview. Within three minutes of the interview, he says, when are the interview guys going to join? So he was wondering if I'm actually just doing a free interview, just generally chit-chatting to him. And he was expecting actual people with gray hair to come, with receding hairline, to come and interview him. And that is when um, I gave up all my ego on hiring. All I learned was, give your best shot at hiring. If it works out, it works out. Else, not, there's nothing much you can do. So, and not to mention, that guy never did join us. Right, so one of the things, again, moving entirely into a different track, is we like to be personal. People like doing business with people, and this is something which we absolutely follow. If you go to our About Us page, every single person in the team is listed, and there's a whole human side to it. So I'll just read out one for you. That's one of my favorite. Raju, he's actually a head of customer development, and his profile goes like, speaks no less than 28,637 words a day, of which only 42 are meaningful, of which only 13 are in context, loves being called the bald and the beautiful by the people he loves, and he's the in-house DJ. Simple personal descriptions for everyone in the team. Two things. Anyone who is in the team feel important. No other company, a big company, would do that. Second, when our customers go through this page, where they find that we are as much we as much love pizza and beer as they do, they become very friendly with us. So the technical support problems become a personal problem. And they say, hey, you guys can do it tomorrow, no worries about it. We have had so many sales, we have had so many partnerships just because customers went through this page and they realized it's a human company sitting beside it's a hum, it's a bunch of humans sitting at this end of the spectrum. So all your management write-ups, we are striving to achieve excellence in every field of what we do. Stop that. That's not going to work. Every single company is probably using that. And people love behind the scenes. Everybody wants to know what's happening behind the Kingfisher shoot, Kingfisher shoot, the Maxim shoots, what's happening behind, when, behind the stage when Iron Maiden plays. Give them enough dope. They start feeling friendly with you. So everything that we do in our company, all the parties and everything, we put it live on our company website. Simple examples. This is our pizza party that we have once a week. This is a human pyramid chart. This is our birthday party. This is the time when we worked very hard and we, did not, we ran out of places to sleep in the office, bean bags. 
and we ran out of bean bags, then computer desks. We ran out of computer desks, then other desks. Thank God none of the desks were broken, even though some of the people were overweight. And this is when we released how we do our parties. Whole bunch of it. Everything that we do in our company is posted on our website. And people start feeling personal. They start identifying with us. They feel it's a bunch of good people on the other side. And they do a lot more business with us. So how much more time do I have? Done. OK. So in short, I'll quickly run through two of my favorites, which will take one minute each. This is something which I've given a very fancy name to the coconut principle. Every startup thinks they're doing a very good job. Every startup has a very good customer-facing end, which is the hard side of the coconut. But inside, you have a very soft white layer. And you have water, which is messy. And that's the thing with every startup. I have a very simple point. If you're doing 50% of what you originally achieved to do, or originally aimed to do, you're doing really well. Your marketing metrics are going to fail. Your sales targets are going to fail. Your SDLC uh, principles are going to fail. But keep doing it. Because if you're not doing it, you'll eventually fail. But if you're doing it, you will someday come to a point where it's better. And that is the coconut principle. And the last is the 90% syndrome in a startup. When you start up with a new project, you have 200% enthusiasm. When you are at halfway completion, you will have 50% enthusiasm left. When you have completed 75% of the project, you have 25% enthusiasm left. And at 90%, every other thing in your life, including cleaning up your desk, cleaning up your room, meeting up the person uh, whom you never wanted to meet becomes very important. And that 10% gets stuck. The way we fix it is we publicly announce dates. We announce dates on Twitter. We announce dates on Wikipedia. We are releasing this date. And when we have announced dates, there's no way we can be excused. Because customers are going to pull us and say, hey, you guys didn't release. So we, impose self, we use self-imposed deadlines when it comes to 90% syndrome. And my last point, have fun throughout. Because if you're not having fun, why do it at all? It's your startup. If you're not having fun, go join one of the big service companies. It's going to be a lot better in terms of pay and your environment, and you're not killing yourself. So I'll end with this quote by Guy Kawasaki. The toughest thing about getting started is actually getting started. So if you're thinking about it, get on to it. And if you need any help, uh, this is where I can be reached. Thank you for being such a patient listener.